are very uh, passionate about the ACEs study, about the biology around uh, trauma and the brain development, but where we really connected was in the practice of it, what to do with this science. And he's going to share in his story how he's been working in the UK, um, developing system of care and system change. And, and then I'm going to share a lot of photos of things that has happened in rural Appalachia in my area. Um, and so we really aligned around practitioner, you know, being practitioners. So the reason for today's group is to bring folks such as yourself together, because the ones of you I know, I know that you're working it in healthcare, you're assessing children, you're working in schools with refugees or whatever the topic may be. And so the goal of this group is really um, three things um, to learn from each other. Warren and I do not at all have the answers. Uh, it's, we might be one day ahead of somebody, you know, this has been my journey for the last, since 2014. It's been like building the car while we're driving it. And I know from talking to some of you um, in other conversations, you felt the same way. So we wanna learn from each other. And we also want this group to provide encouragement and to recognize best practices that may be happening in your nation, as well as here in the US. Um, or emerging new practices in various settings um, with the justice field, with juvenile, with a homeless uh, services. Um, and then our third goal is what will be the result? And that would be to truly accelerate the growth and the impact of work in our respective countries, really that we could learn from each other. And I serve on the national trauma campaign in the United States. I'm a part of the core committee and we work uh, with a campaign for trauma-informed policy and practice, CTIP. We also work with ACES Connection and we um, have these conversations in the US. We have them by region, we have them by state. And I I've seen how successful these type of networking conversations can be. And so when Warren and I were working on a presentation we gave recently to the Academy for Social Justice in the UK, um, we thought that maybe this would be something um, there would be interest in. And so by the response today, we're, we're greatly encouraged. Um, so the format for today, um, it's going to be right about a 60 minute presentation. Warren will have about 30 minutes to share about his work, and then I'm going to take it from there. Um, and then I'm really thrilled today that my uh, co developer in the work uh, beginning back in 2014 and my longtime friend, Dr. Andy Clements, um, she's our moderator today. She's a psychology professor that I drug into this work. I know I didn't really have to. She jumped right in um, back when I worked for police. So she's going to moderate. Um, so if you have questions along the way about the presentation that Warren and I are sharing, um, please put it in the chat and we will have time at the end um, for those uh, questions. Now, we want you to know that within the next couple of days after today's event, we're going to follow up with a short eight question survey. And that's where we want to hear from you. Could this kind of group help you? Um, we want to know who you are. We want to know what sector you're in, if you're healthcare, justice, um, education. And then we want to know, do you have an ACES community? Have you had any training? And how could this group help? Do you want to hear from experts? I know between all of us on here today, we know a lot of experts. Um, and we could have experts that come on and share. We want you to share. We want to hear from you. So you're going to get that survey um, in the next couple of days after today's event. And then we also want you to tell us how often this group um, would be helpful to me. Maybe once a month, maybe not, maybe once a quarter. Um, so again, Warren and I are just kind of cracking the door here and we consider you now um, a partners in this endeavor. All right. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Warren Larkin. Thanks, Becky. What a fabulous introduction. Uh, and it's really exciting to see everybody here yeah? because, you know, a few, few weeks ago, we were just kind of talking about the state of the world and thinking about how we might bring people together and talk about the thing that we're really passionate about. So it's so lovely to see everyone. So I'm gonna try and share my screen with you and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a whistle-stop tour uh, into my world and the way I think about things. And then Becky's gonna share some of her ideas. So my work, I'm a clinical psychologist. I spent 25 years working in mental health. Um, originally 
began working in the asylums when people were kind of still kept in big buildings away from everybody else. And it's there that I kind of became interested in trauma and adversity. Um, and I, I've kind of worked through health, um, the health system and kind of done all kinds of jobs from an assistant on the ward through to clinical psychologist, team leader, manager, senior manager, director of services and policy advisor to government. So I guess I'm bringing perspective. That's what I'm offering today, some perspective. And I'm going to talk about why I think prevention is better than cure and why actually we can't keep doing the same things and expecting a different outcome. Why well, more of the same won't work. So I want to start with my one of my heroes, Desmond Tutu. Um, he said, there comes a point when we have to stop pulling people out of the river. We have to go upstream and find out while they're falling in. So this, this vision uh, that Desmond Tutu sums up in this, in this image um, was kind of my epiphany. So after working in specialist mental health services, working in first episode psychosis services, specializing in trauma, so pretty niche, I had a bit of an epiphany when I became um, a clinical director for children's services later on in my career. And I spent time with health visitors going about their work to try and learn about their role. And I had an epiphany and it just, I don't know why it took me so long, but I realized that what I was doing was, was kind of probably of some value, but actually the real solutions to the problems in society, the problems that we were dealing with, were actually in supporting families, were actually in supporting the early years and ultimately in, in investing more in prevention. So that's why I always start with Desmond Tutu. Um, ultimately, most of us are aware of this research into adverse childhood experiences. It's over 20 years ago. Uh, I remember reading this when it came out and thinking these, you know, Felicity and Andrew are gonna get the Nobel prize. Uh, this is incredible. It kind of confirms what we've always had suspicions of. Um, but actually, the work that they pioneered was given a very frosty reception. Um, it wasn't accepted with open arms. It's only probably in the last five years that you're seeing this science appear in public health policy um, and, and find its way into practice. So for a very long time, society was not ready for this. Um, Obviously, it was a really important study uh, because they found that child adversity was incredibly common. Uh, they discovered that there was a dose response relationship between the amount of child adversity someone experienced and their later life outcomes in terms of mental health outcomes, physical health outcomes and social outcomes. So that was a start of a movement, a start of a scientific endeavour um, that over the last 20 years has, has pretty much replicated those findings. So all of the household surveys that happen nationally and regionally, they all seem to find the same things that, you know, the bigger the dose of adversity or toxic stress, as the Harvard Center for Child Development have called it, uh, the, the, the worse the outcomes tend to be across a population. I think it's really important to say that on an individual level, the number of aces you experience in your outcomes aren't necessarily set in stone. You know, people can have a whole list of those 10 adversities and still do really well. You know, most of us, probably statistically, the majority of us on this call have experienced some adversity in our lives and probably more than one from that list. But it doesn't mean we don't live healthy and productive lives because we also know about science of resilience. We know that there's a balance between the exposure to health harming experiences and traumatic experiences and the assets that we've got, social assets, the coping strategies, the resilience um, assets that we develop. So key things to recognise are this dose response relationship has been found in pretty much every study that's looked for it. Um, childhood adversity is incredibly common and it's probably the single biggest opportunity we've got if we're going to improve, you know, population health going forward. It's probably one of the the last major milestones in public health in terms of, you know, properly transforming outcomes for people. And I say that because we know the last 20 years, this research has told us that people with more adversity have worse health. They have more chronic illness, multiple conditions, more cancer, more heart disease, more mental health problems. They're, they're more often the victim or perpetrator of violence. And they tend to struggle more in education, at work, use more health resources, 
and it get involved in the criminal justice system more often. So actually there's a humanitarian reason for working on um, preventing and mitigating the impact of ACEs. But there's also a, an economic, a health economic argument. In England and Wales, um, the annual cost of adversity, the harms associated with adversity, is 42.8 billion pounds a year. And most of that's related to mental health problems and cancer. So what else do we know about the impact of adversity? Well, it's related to pretty much all of the major mental health problems that are causing um, disability and burden for people in their lives and also creating demand in the health system. So thanks to Philippe Varesi from Manchester who did this, um, did this slide, which sums up all the most definitive. <laughs> Um, so as you can see, unresolved childhood trauma has a massive impact in society and most of these mental health problems have got a strong and proportionate relationship with childhood trauma. The other thing we know, I think it's really important to recognise, is that when people go through adversity in childhood, it affects their development, it affects their ability to self-regulate, it affects attachment. It affects your ability to self-soothe. It affects your ability to cope and have social competence. And the consequence of that for a lot of people is that they engage in health harming behaviors. They, they engage in attempts to feel better that very often have counterproductive outcomes for counterproductive um, side effects, if you like. And one of the things I recognized a number of years ago in my own clinical work was that pretty much everybody that I was trying to help with addictions, whether it's drugs, food, sex, gambling, alcohol, smoking, violence, whatever whatever it was they were doing to try and feel better, that actually the system around us was very much focusing on the symptoms but ignoring the cause. And as a consequence, the treatments and interventions that were available were not actually solving the problem. Uh, very often, the, the response from the wider system is to try and remove that person's attempt to cope. So if it's drugs, if it's opiates, the treatment approach will be harm reduction and then abstinence and we know that in the UK the best outcome for drug treatment for opiates is 10 percent which means 90 percent of people are not succeeding in withdrawing from opiates and that's partly because not not because of the dedication of the the amazing people who work in those services but primarily because the, the services are commissioned without a significant therapeutic component um, they don't necessarily help people find safer and better ways of coping and at the same time address their adverse childhood experiences, either individually or in group therapy. And unfortunately, they're still in pain. As Gabo Mate says, you know, the, the wrong question is why are you addicted? The right question is why are you in pain? So very often we try and take away a vulnerable person's means of coping. Uh, and it's the same with obesity. The original discovery of ACEs was in Vincent Fleet's obesity treatment program. And we know that if you give someone bariatric surgery, they will lose body weight. But in that population, we also see higher rates of other addictions because if you take away one ability, one means of self-soothing and coping, people will search for another if they haven't dealt with the underlying pain or they haven't been given help to find safer and better coping strategies. There's also a higher rate of suicide in that population. It's the same with the criminal justice uh, system in the UK. It isn't that we haven't got loads of dedicated, amazing people working in that sector. It is unfortunate that the system isn't designed to provide therapeutic support for people who are trying to deal with unresolved trauma. So instead, we use the prison system. And unfortunately, that deals with the symptoms, but it doesn't deal with the underlying causes. So for me, this is part of the solution. And we call, you know, it's been from the early 2000s referred to as trauma-informed practice, the idea that we assume and understand that most of the people that are seeking our help have experienced trauma and that actually there's some value in us understanding that and also helping them to understand the impact that that's had on their lives, the impact that's potentially having on how they're coping and also maybe we can find, help, find ways of helping them cope which are safer and better for themselves and for their families. So this is kind of, you know, where this term came from. It originated in mental health services. Um, this book was published in 2001. And I remember doing talks. Um, I presented the first talk, I think, on the subject of trauma and psychosis at a conference in, in, in um, I think it was Warwick, um, 
20 years ago and there were about three people came to that and I think two of them were in the wrong place so it wasn't it wasn't a subject that people were particularly interested in or, or receptive to at the time certainly in the UK um, I think the the bio, biomedical perspective was absolutely dominant for quite a long time but I think you know mid to late 2000s we started to see a shift and we certainly know it's certainly in the UK seeing a huge interest in trauma-informed care a massive openness to understanding what we can do better in terms of providing services and, and support for people. And of course, it involves all of these branches of science. And if we can assume that most of the people that seek our help will have, a, will have experienced trauma, then probably we won't go far wrong. There is a lot written about this, and I'm sure Andy and Becky you know, could talk about this all day, because uh, some of that work obviously pioneered in the USA. But... I, I like the, the practice standards that were published in Oregon for mental health services. They, they produced some checklists and some standards that services can measure themselves against. And as you can see, it looks at everything from the way an organization recruits people, their vision, their mission, what they measure, how they incentivize practice, how they look after the workforce and how they train the workforce and the environment in which they deliver care and actually what they are delivering. So, you know, trauma for practice isn't just kind of one person trying to do things a bit differently. It's a whole organisational approach. And I think once you've got services that are looking at this from an organisational perspective, that's a positive step forward. But then you've got to ask yourself, well, is that enough? Well, it's a part of the solution. But actually, we also have to look at the fact that this is a social problem. This originates in society. This is ultimately... You know, many of the health problems and the health behaviors that we're seeing are the consequence of health inequalities. They're the consequence of poverty, of discrimination, of lack of community cohesion, of lack of opportunity, of lack of social capital, um, not having a safe place to live, not living in a neighborhood where you can go out and take your family down the street without being worried about violence. And we know that those conditions put huge amounts of pressure on, pressure on parents. And if you put parents in incredibly stressful and pressured situations, they will struggle to cope themselves. And in turn, they will struggle to cope, for the cope with their children and parent their children. In fact, we know that children who grow up in poverty are three times more likely to experience some kind of abuse at some point and seven times more likely to experience some kind of neglect at some point. And it isn't because the parents don't care about them. You know, it's usually because they're under so much pressure that they just can't meet their basic needs. And of course, that means that adversity, childhood adversity in and around the home is much more likely. So this is really an issue of tackling inequalities as much as it is tackling individual um, distress or disability. So once we accept that trauma is impacting the people we're trying to help, and if we can be a bit more sensitive to that, we'll probably have better outcomes. We also then have to think about, well, what does that mean in terms of prevention? Lots of public health bodies have, have presented data on this, but this is the one from Public Health Wales. Um, and they calculated based on the English ACE study that if we could prevent ACEs impacting the next generation, we would see massive health gains across the population. For example, we would see almost 40% less unintended teenage pregnancies, almost 60% less use of crack and heroin. Half as many people experience violence as a victim or, or being involved as a perpetrator and half as many people go into prison. So the prize is huge. And the good news is because this is so predictable at a population level, it's also incredibly preventable. Um, we have the technology, we know what works. Um, most global public health bodies have published an evidence review. Uh, the CDC have done that, Public Health Wales have done it, the Early Intervention Foundation have done it, United Nations have done it. Um, there are loads and they all broadly say the same things, which is we can and should transform outcomes for the next generation. It's not simple and I'm not trying to minimise it, but with long-term vision and cross-sector commitment and drawn on the evidence that we've got, we can see a massive transformation for the next generation. But it will require that long term commitment and also that shift in emphasis from picking up the pieces to 
investing in the early years. So my, my summary of reading all that evidence is that there are four areas that we need to focus on. First one is prevention. So primary prevention, you know, let's stop children being exposed to adversity and, and help families and communities and give them the best start in life. Um, support child and family well-being and you know reinvest in some of those interventions that have been decimated over the years certainly in the uk you know there are far less children's centers um there are far less the remit of health visitors is far less uh, there are less specialist health visiting programs like family nurse partnership um we also have to there are far less parenting interventions available than they used to be we also need to get better at finding out what's happened to people earlier on. So if we can ask people what happened, offer them the right help and mitigate the impact of their adversity, that's a massive step forward and one of the cornerstones of trauma-informed practice. Um, and if I can talk to you about the work I do around ACE Inquiry at another session, if that's of interest. But I think many services still don't ask people what happened to them. And I know in California, they're rolling out a huge program of a screening. And whilst I don't think screening in the UK is appropriate, I do think asking people who are seeking help what happened to them in a sensitive and thorough way is absolutely what's required. Because at the moment, we don't do that. And consequently, people get either ineffective treatment or the wrong treatment. And sometimes treatment that might be harmful because they're not, we're not, you know, understanding the full picture. And then the final thing is, you know, investing more in resilience building programs across the life course, uh, you know, everything from letting young children know what their rights are, you know, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, you know, Miss Kendra's list, if, if you've seen the film Resilience, is getting young children to know what's right and wrong in terms of relationships and their rights, you know. Um, safe relationship programs, uh, mentoring schemes, you know, there are all these, these opportunities to build resilience and offset adversity that are still, they aren't common, certainly not in the UK. One example that I really like is this, this is just one example of primary prevention. So when you look at parenting programs, when they're targeted, which is usual, they're very effective. They save money, they improve parental mental health, child conduct, readiness for school, all of those things. But when you make them universally available, like they, Professor Ron Prins and his colleagues did in South Carolina, they also did it in um, Queensland, I think, and in, in Ireland, you see an incredible benefit. And in this study in South Carolina, the benefit was after two years that they saw a decrease in child maltreatment by 23.5%. And this was at a time when rates of child maltreatment were going up because it was kind of just after the 2008 global recession. They also saw less children being removed from home by 9% and 10.5% less non-accidental injuries um, at the same time that it was increasing in, in surrounding counties. So not only can you reduce child maltreatment by helping parents and supporting parents, um, you can also save money because this intervention here saved nine dollars for every dollar that was spent on it and that's just one example those documents that i mentioned earlier those evidence reviews contain hundreds like this this is this is i've not got time really to talk about it but to my mind you've got a number of ways of beginning this journey from where we are now to kind of a more preventative and trauma informed perspective um, part of it is really investing in primary prevention interventions some of it undoubtedly is focusing more on early detection and mitigation and the final part is you know let's make sure that people who are already affected by adversity and trauma let's make sure they get access to the evidence-based help that we know makes a difference because currently in the uk it's a lottery you know if you want trauma focused cbt or emdr or something else or even bereavement counseling it is a bit of a postcode lottery you know it depends where you live and we know those interventions are cost effective so it makes no sense you could you could also make sense of it from a social ecological perspective and you could decide where are your interventions as a region or place against what we know works at an individual level family level community level and societal level you could map your interventions against the best evidence across the four categories that I showed earlier. 
Well, the bottom line is you've got to start somewhere. And, and very often I start with a why. And I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek's work around, you know, what motivates people to make change. And it is ultimately connecting with a cause or a vision. And I often start working with partnerships around system change. And it is a bit overwhelming at the beginning, but ultimately you've got to start by saying, well, have you got a shared vision in your region or your partnership? What is your desired future? for the people of your regional county is have you got a cause that you signed up to you know <clears throat> if you ask your employees what's your shared vision they all should be able to give you the same answer you know it's a bit like when jfk went to nasa and said to the guy sweeping the floor in the corridor what do you do here and he said well i help put people on the moon sir and that's the kind of you know succinct and you know, aligned response we want from all of our employees and citizens. You know, what what is it that you're signed up to? And I think, you know, Martin Luther King talked about having a dream. Um, he didn't talk about having a spreadsheet with a 20 year business plan. You know, it, it was very much, this is my vision. I want to see a, a future where my children can play with white children, and they're judged on the quality of their character, not the color of the skin. You know, that was what got people um, to follow him. 250,000 people turned up to his speech in Washington that day. And that was before the internet. So, you know, there's something about having a shared vision that people will, will kind of get passionate and, and excited about that I think is really important. The other thing I, I ask partnerships is, how, how are you going to co-produce this solution with your citizens? You know, because this isn't something that we can do to our citizens. This isn't something we can, it's not a medical problem. We can't treat them. You know, we have to bring them with us. We have to uh, co-produce and co-own these solutions. And a big part of it for me, because we're so, we have still have such a kind of racist and uh, unequal society in many places that we have to make that a prominent part of our vision, in my opinion. And then finally, how do you make sure through your leadership that this vision is long-term, that it's ultimately going to outlast your tenure? So if I'm talking to a group of chief executives or politicians, what I want to get them to think about is how they're going to make sure that this commitment carries on beyond their time in office, beyond their tenure in this job. Because this is the 20 or 30 year journey. This is not something that we want to change when we get a new leadership. This is something we want to commit to. Um, it's a bit like investing in the stock market. Um, you've got to kind of just make make your investment and then say, I'm not going to look at this every week and change my mind just because the, the graph goes up or down, you know, I'm in it for the long term and this is an investment in the future. So final, final couple of points. One of the things I do with partnerships and agencies is to work with this model. I develop this model called the task model trauma system change. And it's really based on, my experience of implementing programs in the NHS, uh, my experience of leadership development, but also in system change in the latter years of my career and policy advice. And I, I won't go into detail, there's huge amounts of detail behind, behind each of these layers, but you kind of have to know where to start. So I often get partnerships or leadership groups to get together, commit a day or half a day, and we break them into different um, different tables, different groups, and we get them to focus on each of these layers, you know, so based on everything we've learned so far, based on everything you understand, based on all the science and what you know about your community and your people, what, what are your best ideas about how we can co commence this journey from the perspective of community? How are we going to engage them, empower them? How are we going to communicate? How are we going to build assets? How are we going to make this a collective effort? Then we talk about how we're going to get the workforce to have the right knowledge and skills and confidence to do this work. And if we're going to ask them to do this work, how are we going to support them personally and professionally? And how are we going to use commissioning to drive change? How are we going to use local influence rather than waiting for the government to tell us what to do? How are we going to bring together the leaders in our area or region in a way that means they're inextricably linked and they don't go off and do their own thing all the time but instead they act on behalf of the whole which is kind of where the, the idea for this session came about that you know maybe we can share our learning maybe we can connect around a shared purpose 
And maybe we can help each other by not just replicating effort. Maybe we can take the best from all of our insights and learnings from around the world. And maybe we can tie ourselves around a shared purpose. And then finally, obviously, we need to, a bigger investment in prevention and we need to do the things that we know make a difference and reinvest in those things and commit to it. Uh, and if it means shifting, you know, two, three, four, five percent of your collective budget every year for the next five to ten years before you see a difference, then so be it. But you have to make a start. And finally, make sure that the things that we know work are accessible to people. Because that sounds basic, you know, it sounds really basic, but in many areas, people cannot access psychosocial help. They cannot access social prescribing. They can't access evidence-based therapies. There's an inequality when it comes to mental health and social problems. You know, if you have cancer, you get seen in two weeks. If you have a mental health breakdown, you could be waiting a year before anyone sees you. And that isn't sensible or cost-effective. So I'll leave you this this thought, Arthur Ashe, from one American to, to my colleague, Ameri uh, <laughs> Becky, but Arthur Ashe, I like his quotes because he achieved a lot in his career and he, he always said, you know, when things seem insurmountable and you're not sure where to begin, um, just start where you are, use what you have and do what you can, you know, and ultimately, if now is not the right time, when is? Do you want another year of strategic planning? Do you want another year of thinking and for things to line up the right way? Or are you just going to make a start? And, and I think Becky's work uh, is a beautiful uh, segue into that notion, really. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to say thank you for your attention. And I'll hand over to Becky. Thank you. Press the button. There we go. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. Uh, all right. Let me find... Uh... Yes, thank you, uh, Warren, for just your inspiring work and, um, and your collaboration in this. Um, so uh, kind of building on some of the things that um, Warren shared, um, I first learned about this topic while I was working for police. Um, my job title, I, I oversaw, I was hired to oversee a very large crime reduction grant and it was to reduce drug related and violent crime in Northeast Tennessee, as well as um, reduce recidivism. And one of the things I see so many wonderful comments uh, coming up of resources. And, and I think that's one of the things that we'd hope that this group could generate. Um, but one of the things I've learned in my experience, and now as a national and international trainer and coach, helping organizations and cities um, to move on this journey to trauma-informed, is as Warren pointed out, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, I often in my presentations liken it to um, tobacco. Uh, both of my parents, uh, when I was a child, uh, were heavy smokers, and I could see over 40 years or so uh, a transition away from um, the use of tobacco to seeing the, the health-related uh, effects. And, um, and so, you know, this is one of my favorite quotes is that this is a, a journey. Um, it's not a destination. Um, so we hope that this group could encourage each of you um, in your respective nations on that journey. And then another thing that's important to me and the training, I'm sure I've trained upward maybe 20, 25,000 individuals now, because when I left the police department and went to work in healthcare, I began to train entire school districts, not just schools, but districts. So I would have 500, 700 teachers in an auditorium at a time, and it begins to add up quickly. Um, but one thing is I've never, it's not one size fits all. Um, I have two lovely sisters and two brothers, and I grew up wearing a lot of hand-me-downs. And, um, and if it was in your closet and it came from sis, um, you know, whether it was exactly your size or whatever. And I find that very true with trauma-informed practices is it's not one size fits all. And one of the most inspiring things I see in this work, and I often like 
liken it to handing you a trauma-informed lens and you go back into your setting in healthcare or justice or schools or higher education and you're the boots on the ground and you know what is going on in that setting and then the applications that I'm going to share with you have been from our champions that have emerged within a two-state area uh, of rural Appalachia. All right, so let's see here. Okay. There we go. Okay, so how did the work begin here? Um, well, in 2014, I was working, as I said, with police. I oversaw 19 police programs aimed at reducing recidivism as well as drug-related and violent crime. And I heard a presentation about the ACEs study and, and Warren kind of mentioned his uh, epiphany or his aha moment. And at some point when we have some of the others that are on this call today share, I'd say that you're gonna have a similar story. And so when my job description and the title on my door was drug, you know, and crime prevention uh, director. Um, and I heard Dr. Folletti say that uh, in the ACEs study, they found that a man who scores yes on six of the 10 questions had a 4,600% increase of being an IV drug user. I wondered as a mother and a grandmother, uh, I wondered why that was not a part of this conversation. And another thing that I think helped the work advance here was that I had um, this successful crime prevention programs. We went on to win national awards, two national awards in the United States. We ended up creating a program for the state of Tennessee to reduce recidivism. Tennessee recidivism is 48% uh, that with someone comes out of jail within one to three years, they're likely to go back. And just this week, I saw the news that program was acquired by the Tennessee Department of Corrections. And our governor just funded $4.7 million to the expansion of that program across our state. Um, and so that program, when people graduate, it reduces recidivism down to 21%. Um, so we were working together on projects, and I think that kind of helped our work spread. Um, and then we, uh, before I breathe the word of this to anyone, I created what's called the notebook. Um, if you're a grant writer or a program manager, you have binders like this probably in your office, which I did. And so before I told anyone what I was thinking about um, how to Im embed trauma-informed practice into our different settings, I took this notebook and I put 35 tabs in it of all the organizations I worked with. I put in there community garden, housing authority, foster care, mental health, health care, juvenile justice, criminal justice, probation and parole, jails, everybody that was involved in my program. And I didn't know what I was gonna find. I'd never heard the word system of care before. Um, I just filled an empty notebook full of tabs and I began to research. And thankfully I came across ACES Connection back in 2014. And I began to find out uh, that people were publishing articles of meaningful programs that were starting to have some positive outcomes around this. And I filled the notebook so full with those articles that I wasn't even able to shut it. And that's what actually convinced me that there was an application of using a trauma-informed lens in every type of setting. And so then my next step, um, I learned in 2014 that SAMHSA, which in the United States, that's the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, they offered a concept paper and they suggested, among many things, that communities should address trauma through a multi-agency uh, educational approach. And so here, it seemed to me, if the leading, um, you know, mental health and substance uh, reducing agency in our nation is suggesting a public health approach across multi-agencies, um, that then this was surely the thing to do. Um, so I made an appointment um, with um, the university, East Tennessee State University in our, my town. And I thought, well, this is education. We need educators. Um, who's going to listen to this woman from the police department, you know? So I went over in 2015, the summer, and presented to several of the faculty members there what my findings were and how showed the notebook of how there was an application. And 
in every type of sector. Um, and my longtime friend, who's our moderator on the call today, Dr. Andy Clements, um, she is a psychology professor and she had gotten very involved in my programs at the police department just as a community member. Recently, she's won two of the highest awards in her university because of her community service around those programs. So when we finished with my presentation, uh, very kindly, the department chair said, you know, we don't feel at this time that's something we should take on. But two days later, uh, Andy, she emailed me and said, you know what, I'll help you. Now, I want you to know that I was running 19 programs at the police department. She's a full time faculty member with classes teaching statistics and the things on her caseload. This wasn't in our job description. This wasn't we didn't have a budget. Um, and we just felt very passionate about that. And those of you that are on this call today that I've actually spent time talking to, I know you're, we're cut out of the same mold, um, that we, you know, that we know that this has to be addressed. And one of the reasons for this meeting today was Warren and I could see in our respective countries um, what COVID-19 was bringing, this universal trauma that every nation has experienced, and that we knew that addressing trauma and adverse childhood experiences was also a universal situation that needed to be addressed. So the first step, we had a conference call with um, Joan Galise, the director of the National Center for Trauma-Informed Care funded by SAMHSA. She sent me a course called the Trauma-Informed Approach. Uh, it was my copy still has the watermark draft on it. And mm -hmm. um, I modified it to uh, shorten it at the time. It was about an eight hour course. We felt that might be a little hard to get professionals. And I just began talking about what I learned at my crime prevention programs. And so many of the leaders that were in our community, uh, directors, mental health, directors in healthcare, directors in cancer research clinic, directors in food uh, scarcity programs, housing authority, mm -hmm. all those see we're in my crime prevention meetings and I never ask anyone could we come and train them one by one by one they started to line up so in the spring of 2016 we began to train area professionals again in um, addition to working our regular day jobs I would go in at six in the morning um, to keep my police programs running because I didn't want my chief of police nor my city manager or the mayor to ever feel that this work was taking away um, from what I was doing, because at the time, you know, they didn't have the recognition that this was as important. Then in 2016, shortly after we trained a few organizations, we, we saw the need to collaborate. So we started what we called a system of care, and then we began to meet uh, on a bi-monthly basis. So fast forward three years later, and about 100 trainings and um, showing uh, paper tigers several times. And I created a train the trainer around that SAMHSA training. Uh, and we'd had trained over 4,000 individuals, um, professionals in different sectors. We had 40 organizations showing up at our system of care. So uh, Dr. Clements and I, we wrote to the National Center for Trauma-Informed Care. And we said, could we host a webinar in 2018 of all the cities that have followed the SAMHSA recommendation in the concept paper. And we received a note back from Dr. Joan Galise, the director of the SAMHSA funded National Center for Trauma-Informed Care. And her statement, one of her statements read, though many communities across the nation are beginning to implement these recommendations, Johnson City clearly stands out as a leader in embracing this model. And that was the first time that we knew something had happened in Johnson City that maybe was unusual. I mean, I figured if I learned learned about it. Um, I'm the most ordinary person that you probably would ever meet. And I figured if I was learning about this, then I'm the last person that probably scores of people are ahead of me in implementing this in my town. Uh, but this is when we learned that the work here and the diversity of the sectors was unique in Johnson City. And so we hosted a forum in 2018. We had two governor's wives come, people from 20 states, and we told our story. Um, and shortly after that, I was offered a role to move to a three-state healthcare system um, that serves predominantly Southwest Virginia, Northeast Tennessee, and um, some spots in North Carolina. 
and they asked me to become their first ever trauma-informed administrator. And my role there was to implement measures to help them become a more trauma-informed system. Uh, and during that time, I developed develop trainings for healthcare staff. I deliver these trainings uh, to healthcare team members in two of the 21 hospitals. One of the hospitals in 20, uh, January and February of 2020, before COVID shut things down, I trained over 700 uh, hospital workers. We had the dining staff, the cafeteria staff, the security, the cardiologist, the radiologist. And it was so inspiring to me in six weeks to train two, 700 healthcare team members because I knew that from talking to others in healthcare that who patients talk to more than anyone during a hospital stay are the housekeeping staff. And you could just see the housekeeping staff just sit up with just a sense of pride in the fact that now they're hearing a message that they are so vital in the help of and rebounding, rebounding in health to the patients that would come in um, to the system. Um, and then I began to raise awareness throughout rural Appalachia. And I begin to provide training to regional community partners, including police, because when I was at police, I developed a training that's now certified as officer education uh, for in two states, in Tennessee and Oklahoma. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And then I reasoned that if my health district had 50 school districts in the footprint, would the health of the health system improve over 10 years if we begin to get trauma sensitive school districts? So in the 18 months that I worked there, I helped train eight school districts. Four of those districts were superintendent down, which is very unusual in the states. Typically you'll have a school, you'll have a principal, but we have, and I've published about some of this in ACES Connection. And so what I began to see working for the police and city government and working in healthcare, I began to hear, like Warren pointed out, the expense of many of the challenges that not only face every community, but every city around the world. And I saw where imprisonment had not reduced state drug problems. And in 2014, the Pew Charitable Trust actually did a study between New Jersey and Tennessee and Tennessee ranks fifth uh, in using imprisonment as a form of handling uh, drug crimes, while New Jersey is 45th, but yet both states continued to grow at the same rate with drug use. And then I saw addressing homelessness during my time at the police department. I headed the homeless task force, working directly with our mayor and our chief of police and city leaders. And I saw that in 2013. The American Journal of Public Health said that childhood adversities are substantially overrepresented in homeless samples. The Bill Gates Foundation on Ending Homelessness says that if we ignore the piece of childhood trauma, that could be a key to solving um, the challenge of homelessness in many cities I know in the U.S. And then I saw that um, Dr. Filetti and Anna did a subsequent study to the ACES study and involved 125,000 patients. And they found that when um, people were just asked about their overall life um, and things that could have produced trauma or toxic stress, household dysfunction, that they began to see a 35% reduction in doctor visits and an 11% reduction in emergency room visits. Um, so just like Warren, it landed on me to the idea that trauma is not an excuse for drug addiction or criminal behavior, but now it offered us an explanation. And the good news about, I've watched that movie Resilience so many times, and the quote that says, what's predictable is preventable. And the ACEs are fact, but not fate. And in my years at the police department, overseeing the development of the felony uh, program with felony offenders with addictions. You know, I listened for four years to stories of those incarcerated, you know, who talked about their mother trying to kill them with a pillow, trying to smother them to death, about an uncle at the age of five that they would come to their home every Friday and rape them because they told that little child that they were trash and, 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 and stories that I'll never forget. And 
professionals, I reasoned as I heard these things that no one picks where they start in life. And that what the ACEs showed us was that we could now offer hope. And we could say, though we can't pick where we start, you know what, our organization, our community, our school, our healthcare can come alongside and we can help your finish look different. So it helped us now to have an upstream approach. And I also began to look at it as an AED program. In 2005, when my mother went out to run some errands, my father, at 72 years old, had a massive heart attack and died all alone. And, you know, one of my brothers is very involved in the country music um, setting, and he took a year off of the concert promotion and he began to raise awareness to the placement of AEDs because as a family, we had experienced this tragedy that had someone been on hand with possibly an AED, it could have saved our father's life or at least lengthened it. And so if you think about building a system of care in comparison to the public placement of these AEDs, you know, these devices 30 years ago or however long when they started, were put in places like train stations, bus stations, college campuses, elementary schools, shopping malls, and this emergency life-saving equipment is now saving thousands of lives because a secretary is trained, a, a chemistry professor is trained, a football coach is trained. And I liken creating a community of resilience around this same principle. You know, a couple summers ago, we had a, an accident, a car crash in, in Tennessee that made national news. In middle Tennessee, there was a pileup. It involved tractor trailers. It involved... Um, uh, several cars and and uh, cars were on fire and and uh, just a horrific wreck and that night on the news they interviewed a good Samaritan a young man who was one of the first upon the scene that was not involved in the crash and he began to tell heroically how he ran from vehicle to vehicle pulling people out to safety and professionals not one person said to that young man wait a minute we're waiting on first responders to get here we're waiting on the police we're waiting on the the fire department. No, they were just thankful that someone knew how to come along and to help. And so in my mind, that was a way to advance trauma-informed care. So getting started, one of the things that I think has been unique to our area is we kept our message simple. We kept it urgent and an expectation of using it. So in 2016, about a year after we started our work in Northeast Tennessee, Tennessee under our then governor, Bill Haslam and his wife, Chrissy, they wanted to become a trauma-informed Tennessee. And so Tennessee has been a state that's helped to lead work in our nation. And we're super proud of that. And they had some funding available. So Dr. Clements and I applied for some funding and we wrote a toolkit and we did focus groups with our 40 organizations and, and we built our toolkit around three steps of what we did. And now as an independent consultant and coach, I'm helping other towns to take these steps to advocate, educate, and collaborate. And we talk about very transparently in our toolkit, some of the barriers to reaching police, some of the barriers in healthcare. And, and we're delighted when we hear people around the world now looking at this toolkit. All right, now the last things I'm gonna just share kind of quickly um, are some of what our community champions did. So our after school programs, and I'm on the board of the one that's photoed here, um, the Boys and Girls Club, um, instead of kids having sometimes a punitive approach to their discipline, now the staff is trained, the volunteers are all trained, and we put in a calming room. And so uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs are in most of the cities, in, in many places in the United States, and many Boys and Girls Club directors and staffs, at least in Tennessee, have come to visit this calming room and learn about some of the things that the staff are doing, because the staff now know that it's not not willful behavior of a child, but it's survival behavior. And then one of the most delightful surprises are libraries. I actually have a director of libraries in the state of Florida now that I'm working with, and she was here in Tennessee, and we went and presented together 
here in Delaware after the First Lady of Delaware came to visit Tennessee about the unique work going on in our libraries where they started mindfulness coloring for adults. They started serve and return reading groups for preschoolers. They put together the staff out of their own money, put together take-home bags for caregivers that come and learn how to do serve and return activities with the children. Um, and this is happening in our libraries. Many of the libraries in our area now have a trauma-informed um, section where people can read about it if you're a professional working this in your field or if you're someone who's a trauma survivor. To me, one of those most uh, heart wrenching stories back in the time when COVID really shut things down, the library in Carter County, they said they have a real vibrant youth program and they set the box of books for the youth to continue to read outside the door of one of the shops downtown. And so that the youth could have these books to, as a means of encouragement because that group knew that many of those youth were now cut off from healthy relationships at school. And then we began to see a state program called Isaiah 117. It's a faith-based program that started when a couple went to PATH classes, which in the States is how you get trained to, to be able to be foster parents. And on the last class, the director at the Department of Children's Services said, this is where you'll pick your child up. Uh, and they, she pointed to the office and the woman in the couple began to cry. And she said, wait a minute, a little child will be staying here all night. And she said, oh yes, because we have nowhere to take them and until we can find placement. And it's a really long, but a very inspirational story. This couple has now opened many of these homes in Tennessee. I saw their, I just trained all their staff in November at their staff retreat. And now they've colored in the map. Uh, we've did an article in ACES Connection. And now almost, uh, I think it's 30 some states are reaching out to raise up these Isaiah 117 houses. And their slogan is love, you're not alone. Because this couple realized on the worst day of the life of a child, transitioning away from parents into foster care, how that they, it's not that child's fault. And they could go into a warm and loving home where there was there for a few hours to get a bath or to get a meal. And every child that leaves there has $300 worth of clothing in a small bag that they take from there. And then we began to see our public housing, some of them get trained and they began to train maintenance, the staff and, and, and just begin to see some beautiful things start to happen there. And then here's the coalition that I mentioned. These gals down there, they're running this drug and alcohol coalition over the weekend they had a training on trauma-informed coaching for the coaches of the park and rec program as warren pointed out they are also implementing triple p parenting and then they noticed that sometimes the kids hanging out at the park the younger kids that are 12 and 13 they always had a one-year-old or a two-year-old with them or a baby in a stroller and what they realized is that these young siblings these young teens are raising um actually these little children because of a parent's drug addiction. And so they began to raise money from the faith community and business owners for $25. So they started offering safe sitter classes, which helps a babysitter to know how to do the Heimlich maneuver and CPR. And they started teaching this to the siblings. Actually, this group actually made um, the New York Times. They made the BBC interviewed them. We had folks from France calling because this director talked about a young child who lost a parent um, to addiction in the home. I believe this child was eight years old. So she began to teach some of the very young children about how to administer Narcan because she reasoned, would it be more traumatic for a child to lose a parent or could maybe they at least have the tools that could help to reverse that. And that was covered pretty widely. And then as I moved into the healthcare system, as I mentioned, I began to train schools and what the teachers, what the principals began to do with it. Some of the communities are very hardcore poverty. 85% of the kids are eating um, school lunches or eating school meals three times a day all year long because the school, the, the uh, community coal mines have closed. And so the industry is just not there. And they begin to put in sensory hallways um, 
Um, they begin to, uh, these are some programs that high school students are running. Um, they, they decorated a, 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 a mop room that was uh, used for a counselor. They had a grant in their school at the high school to have a two day a week counselor. And he, the only place for them was a mop room. And these students showed me that on their own break, they began to decorate this little room. And then they noticed that the kids in their class in high school, some of them didn't come with different clothes on each day. And some of them seemed that maybe their clothes were soiled. And so these students started a free laundry program to help instead of bullying. Now they understand the hardship that goes with some of their classmates. And then they began to start another program called Suds for Buds, where they have hygiene products. And here's some other photos of things that great work that schools are doing. De-escalation on the playground, de-escalation through a beach scene in a principal's office. Some of the schools have made the headlines in our local papers. Um, and then we began to see police. Um, when I was working for police, I knew that police work is a lot of social work and that police needed to have a trauma-informed lens. So cre I created a three-hour trauma-informed policing training that I've delivered to multiple precincts in different states. It's accredited for in-service now in two states. Matter of fact, I just completed recording this training and a three-hour educator training for the Tennessee Association of Chiefs of Police. Our governor, Bill Lee, passed a handle with care law. And so I'm working with the Chiefs Association. And as they've launched their handle with care website, there's going to be a free three hour training for teachers and a free three hour training for officers to understand about trauma. And so the handle with care program is basically where officers just notify the schools Joey Brown, handle with care, the name of a child and the three words, handle with care, if they've been on scene with something that could have been traumatic to the child. And then we begin to train juvenile justice, three courts in two states. They've added therapy dogs, then our domestic violence programs. Uh, we started seeing them reach out to the faith community um, to uh, get in some supplies because many victims just come in with the clothes on their back. And then in our community health, again, some of the most inspiring things. Uh, the director of the Children's Cancer Research Clinic, um, she had all her uh, staff trained and she didn't have any time. The, the hospital wouldn't pay for overtime for training. And so she just started having a lunch and learn. And when the group would meet for lunch, one day she would show 15 minutes of the training and next week another 15 minutes. And, and, and over time they got their group trained. And one of the most touching stories was um, and when I before I left healthcare, she and I had lunch. And she told me they'd had five children of the same age that went through two years of chemotherapy because of a life-threatening cancer and that these children were now in remission. They were in a healthy place and they were going to be able to all start in their different cities kindergarten in the coming year. And so her team, because of being trauma-informed, they realized these are children that have never been to daycare, never been to preschool, and that going into school could be a bit traumatic. And so cancer research clinic workers held a life skills class, and they got permission from the parents, and they brought all the children in on one day, and they marched around the hospital. This was before COVID, of course, and they went in the cafeteria and showed them how to order from the menu, how to open a milk carton, how to line up, how to introduce yourself. And is that something that you would likely think would happen in a child cancer research. And then we begin to train our houses of faith. You know, sadly, in this journey, faith is very important to me. It's also important to my colleague, Dr. Clements. And I was very, very saddened to hear that often when people turn to a house of faith, sometimes that's where further victimization has occurred. So we began to train houses of faith in our community. And then we began to see workforce solutions come. Uh, the mayor of a town, she She's a 22-year city commission woman in Bristol, Tennessee. Now they have a program that was grant funded through Tennessee Building Strong Brains. And uh, it connects, it has a new program in the human resources called resource navigation. And without shaming or blaming, if someone is uh, maybe needs a set of tires on their car and this paycheck is needed to pay the rent, they can come in and see the resource navigator who can help connect them to services in the community that can help 
offset this. And the, and the goal of this is that they would be able to sustain the workforce um, by not a, much of a turnover. And this program has been so successful that the Bristol City Schools now partners with it, as well as a very large manufacturing company um, is partnered. So really my last point here, I want to point out, and this is something that um, that I have learned in my journey. And so where Dr. Folletti, they had the pyramid, which is famous to the ACEA study. This is I like to call the funnel of hope. And so obviously, as Warren pointed out, we've realized for years in, in people that have experienced trauma and complex trauma that we need behavioral health. We need behavioral health resources. Um, and I don't think there would be a one of us in our city or our country that would raise our hand and say, you know what, we have enough behavioral health. No, every city, every city lacks a resource or availability of it. Um, but what we have learned in the ACEs study and a trauma-informed approach is that healing happens all along the way. And if you'll notice the pair, the, the way the pyramid is here, I, I believe that over time, as we continue to collect data from our schools, how much trauma is being mitigated instead of children being expelled because of a, a situation, now they're handling it with choices instead of in-school suspension. Some of our schools have actually changed the name to choices. And so we start to see this wider area of healing. Um, and I'll tell a real fast story of a bus driver before COVID in Utah, and she talked about that um, she had a little girl joining the, the bus that year, it was 11 years old, and she just struck up a friendship with this little child. And one of the things about the child was she braided her hair. Um, her hair was braided every day and was so cute. And a few months into the school year, again, before COVID, um, that she noticed the little girl was missing on the bus. And the next day, the little girl missing on the bus and the little girl was missing a whole week. And then she found the next week, the little girl was there and she greeted her and said, I sure missed you last week. And, and, uh, but she noticed the little girl's hair was not braided like she was used to. And a few days she continued to, the girl was back, but no braided hair. And one day the bus driver said to the little girl, she said, I sure miss your hair braids. And the little girl said to the bus driver, last week, my mommy died and my daddy doesn't know how to braid hair. And so one reason that we're training bus drivers when we train schools in rural Appalachia, that bus driver dropped the children off, went to the, star, the, the Walmart, the store, got a bag of bows, a clean hairbrush. And the next day she told the little girl, stay on the bus a minute and I'll braid your hair. And professionals, this was such a significant healing act that the teachers of this child began to say immediately that little girl's spark and confidence started to come back and they reported it to the principal who then reported it to the superintendent and it made the local news and the national news. And so when we're creating empathetic communities, welcoming communities, welcoming organizations, we're going to see some trauma mitigated. And then we see the middle layer. We see last Last night, do you know what I was doing? I was at our after school program, the Boys and Girls Club, and I was leading a group called Family Engagement. If you look at the CDC, and your countries may have this information as well, it talks about community community protective factors. And so I arranged an eight week session. I brought in Goodwill Industries to do job skill training for free, practice interviewing online, how to find jobs online, how to build your resume. I brought in a parenting class. I was sharing with the parents about ACEs. And so what are we doing in this middle layer? We're bringing healing as well through our community navigators and hope. And then we see our access to behavioral health, which again is very important. All right. And so here we see regional acceptance in four years. So before I left the healthcare in April of 2020, the healthcare president he called me to his office in January, myself and the medical vice president, um, academic chief officer of the healthcare system, and asked us to begin to facilitate a conversation with East Tennessee State about starting the Strong Brain Institute. And of March of 2020, Ballot Health gave a generous gift of $1 million over five years to ETSU to start the Strong Brain Institute. So I am now a consultant for the Strong Brain Institute, and along with my independent work. And this 
this was a headlines of our newspaper. And Jane Stevens, who's the founder and editor of uh, Aces Connection, she contacted me when I shared that. And she said, Becky, I think that's the first headline I've ever seen. And so what I want to encourage you today, wherever you are in your country in this journey, is that everyone can make an impact and that um, the passion that I think that we've run with it and from some of you that I know that you share um, that we we can make a difference in the lives of children. So I love this quote from Helen Keller that says all the world is full of suffering, but yet it's also full of overcoming. So with that, my friend, Dr. Clements is going to jump in and see what questions you may have. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> I've been monitoring the chat and there's been a lot of good discussion going on. I've also been saving all of that chat so that, that we have the resources. So many of you have shared resources and that's wonderful. Um, there haven't been so many questions. One, one discussion, back channel discussion was about setting up some sort of online community and that has already been discussed. I'm not gonna commit you to anything, but, um, but I think that's something that would be really well received. Other people have shared um, some of their resources that they have in their various countries. I do, um, Becky had asked me to kind of sum up how many countries were represented. We have 11 countries, which is fantastic. Um, several people from several of them. Um, right now, the US and the UK are tied. So, you know, if anybody wants to call a friend and get someone on real quick to break the tie, that would be great. Um, but if you wanna ask questions now, this would be a great time um, and you could, you should just be able to unmute yourself and ask questions. They've asked mainly to kind of keep it on the topics that they've talked about, rather than the, rather than the future of the organization. After they do the survey, um, they're more um, at that point they'll begin talking about what the future looks like. But if you have questions about what they talked about today, that would be fantastic. So just unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, I, I, I'm uh, sorry. It's Michael Azad here from Tasmania. Hey, Mike, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, it's just w wonderful to see that uh, you're evolving into uh, this international um, framework. And I'm just, um, uh, congratulations to all of you for doing this. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Mike Lazat from Tasmania. I represent an organization called TANA Trauma Awareness Network Australia. And I had the privilege of um, visiting uh, Becky and Andy um, uh, 2018, and I witnessed uh, firsthand uh, the work they're doing. And I, I brought it back to Tasmania, and I've uh, been using um, uh, all the the, um, the stories that, and and the information that I've got I got from them uh, uh, subsequently. So thank you again for that. Uh, at this stage, the question I have for you for you um, uh, all three of you, uh, Tan is about to move into schools now. Um, but we're going to do it uh, collaboratively with um, school psychologists, um, with um, health professionals, um, well-being in terms of um, uh, health and, and, and uh, uh, the food uh, part of um, uh, helping uh, families develop better food regimes. Um, and just uh, bringing professionals, Tana wants to facilitate that. Um, I'm just concerned, I guess, more than anything, um, are there other, other uh, organizations that are, we're not for profit, not professionals, but we were concerned citizens uh, that were trying to do the grassroots approach um, from the, working from the bottom up um, with, with the, from the top down. And we were really concerned that, um, you know, that, uh, that there might be, uh, it might, well, we're always, we're always told it's fraught with danger when you go and start, start conversations with parents. We, we, we envision, um, you know, uh, uh, meeting parents before they pick up their children, um, say from two to two to four, two or two to three in the afternoon, um, and beginning conversations with them and asking them um, wh where we can help with them, uh, where we can help, and and how how we can, um, you know, educate them. We want to advocate, um, you know, the, the 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 whole idea is to educate parents about ACEs without without um, traumatizing, you know, or triggering and. And so we just want to know, you know, uh, like, oh, is it, uh, I'm worried that we're not always going to have a psychologist there or someone, someone to deal with, a, a, you know, a, a tricky situation. Um, do you think, do you think there's anything, do you think, are we, is there anything that you could say that, uh, that we need to do before we get, get involved with this is, I guess, my question. 
Um, well, I'll weigh in and then Warren, you want to add anything or, or even Andy, I've trained a lot of schools. Um, the purpose of this group is Warren and I are both independent consultants. We train every kind of sector. We're happy to help. But the purpose of this group is not to try to, you know, solicit, uh, uh, you know, training opportunities. It truly is to accelerate your work. Um, but one of the things that I have found in working with schools is not to focus on the trauma stories, um, but to focus on the lingering effects of that. And, um, and so that instead of where you, a presentation, so when I go in to talk to a school, often once I've worked with a school district a year or two, they'll give me an opportunity to talk to the parents. And so I talk about strengthening your protective factors. I can show a short little video from the Center for Disease Controls. It talks about personal. That's what I talked about last night at the Boys and Girls Club about what are your personal protective factors? What is your concrete anchors of support? Because the ACEs study showed us that um, nurturing caregivers is all of us on this call today have experienced probably trauma, but because of a friend that we had coffee with or patiently, you know, held her hand at a situation that was, uh, you know, uh, like I mentioned, losing my father, um, you know, that helped us to navigate. So Mike, to your question, I would say, rather than feeling like you had to show up and explain to the parents all about the ACEs, that might be the opportunity, but just the same way we see social distancing, washing hands, and wearing masks is how we navigate COVID. Um, then talk about the things that help families be stronger. You know, bring in the flyers, find out in your community the resources of a job fair or how to apply for a certificate. Someone can get a training that could maybe get them a better job and help bring that kind of information in to strengthen your families. So, Warren, you want to add? Can I maybe come in as well? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was I was thinking of an answer for Michael, but I'm not sure <laughs> if I'm allowed to say something. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, Mark. sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we are not that far in the Netherlands yet, but I know from the Scottish community that they have created ACES hubs. And as far as I understand, those are groups of uh, experienced um, people uh, care experienced people or other people who do an extra training but who uh, sort of uh, constitute groups that come together and having a per person to talk to uh, or people to talk to and to meet one another and to talk about what you experience without shame and blame and guilt uh, might already be a good opportunity uh, Michael for for parents to uh, to talk about the topic and to do to do away with the taboo or the stigma that's associated with it. And if there is maybe one person in such a hub who is a bit more informed than the rest of them, uh, they can maybe guide the process. You don't have to be a, a, a psychotherapist or something. It's mm -hmm. it, because if we get back to the human connection, then we are already working against ACEs because the loss of human connection is the core of the ACEs issue. So uh, maybe it doesn't even have to be that high profile. Mm. Mm. Okay, Marianne, I agree with you totally. So I'm, my name is Adriana Van Outforst. I'm Child Advocacy in New Zealand. And what I have found is that, well, because I, I, I have a background in education. So I was a teacher and in special education but I also have PTSD. And the thing with PTSD is that we, there is, we have never been heard and seen. Mm. And that is the solution, that for me is the solution, a safe place to speak up and share my stories so that people know. And when I, when I finally overcome my fear and I'm starting to share my stories, it encourages others to come forward and speak because they can see that I've done it. So I become a role model for them. And the thing is, you're right. We have to um, stop the shame and blame and we have to rise above it. But I also believe with that connection is the real important key here. Um, and also we have to remember that um, how do we do that and that is to show up so people see us and when they see us repeatedly then they begin to trust us 
And it's not us. We are not the font of all knowledge. We have to work with others and they share that knowledge. And also, you do not need to be totally qualified to speak your truth and your lived experience. You don't need qualifications because this is about trauma and this is individualized to people. And very often I come across people who think that just because they are not educated, they have nothing to contribute. Which is part of the trauma. Which is part of the trauma. Yeah. And that's what the people with qualifications and who read books don't always get. You can't learn all the time from books. It needs a marriage of knowledge from books and lived experience. And it has to be a marriage, not, you know, and, and, and like I say, silence divides us. So joining up, connecting up, and this is face-to-face too. And that's what I, why I like ACES Connection. And that's what we can do in our own countries. We can, we can set up communities with ACES Connection, get the word out, and slowly work with individual people. So basically, I work with individual people, and then I say pay it well, for free, and then I say pay it forward. Pay it forward. Spread the news to other people. That's the payment for me. That's right. So that's well, me. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you both for that. And in the States, we say you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. To no, your- exactly. Yeah. Okay, Warren, did you want to add? Yeah, it? I agree. I think both of those messages are really positive. And I, I just want to follow on by saying I work with schools and a couple of things seem to be helpful. Um, just coming back to Michael's question. One is to come up with a plan with the, with the school professional community in terms of what they want to focus on and when they go on this yeah. journey together. And then to give them a kind of, you know, help them with it, some kind of launch event where we can get everybody to share and understand the vision yeah. and why we want to do this and to ask for their permission and for their support. Uh, that's quite a powerful gesture and quite a powerful um, ritual in terms of getting people to say, you know what, we can do better. We need to be able to talk about this. It affects all of us. It's not just an us and them issue. Um, so I quite like showing the film resilience or something similar and then yeah. have a conversation. So it's not a kind of blaming or, or a conversation that says you need help and we have the answers. It's kind of says, look, this is everybody. This is all of us. We all have some of this in our lives. And just the way that we talk to you about nutrition or good sleep or maths and English and how you help your kids with that. Um, we want you to see us as a school resource as a kind of place to come if you're finding things tough or you want help or advice but I think it's a little bit like mental health issues were a few years ago um, we weren't comfortable talking about it in public we weren't okay about saying I need some help with my mental my mental state or I'm struggling and I think we've come a long way and part of the reason we've we've come a long way is because we are trying really hard to make it acceptable uh, as a public health message. So I think there's something about using a parents' evening or some kind of event at schools to just to get these ideas into people's minds, you know, not to, not to say we're the solution or you should do this or that, but just to say, look, this is something that affects us all. It's okay to talk about it and it's okay to ask for help and we're here if you need, you know, and that's why we're doing this. The school. This is brilliant. Becky and, and uh, uh, um, oh geez, uh, Warren and, and the two that contributed, I feel that thank you for answering it, uh, all of you for answering. I feel like now that's all the things I was thinking. It's it's just backed up my, what, what I was feeling. Uh, and we're prepared now to go in. Uh, uh, thank you so much. It's uh, that's That's all I needed to hear. Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. We're right at our time here. I, Stephanie's got to go to bed. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. What a champion. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that um, watch for the survey um, that's going to come. And it's just eight questions. So if you'll just fill that out, then we could hear how this group could help you. Um, and then we have talked about maybe a closed group on social media. 
Um, I'm a part of one that's for educators, has about 25,000 people in it. And um, you can only like share trainings that you do or whatever on one day a week. The rest of it is just Q&A, helping each other, answering questions, posting resources, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, that might be something that we would start as well. So um, I'm going to let Warren just give any other closing word. And if Andy wants to pop in real quick, but thank you all for the work that you're doing. And um, I just, I've just been delighted to spend part of my afternoon with you. And hope to see you again hey, soon. Becky, I think Robin had a question. Did you have a question, Robin? Oh, Robin. Yes, I do. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Robin. Uh, uh, I and my friends uh, started an organization to prevent suicides in Lithuania. Originally, I'm from Pakistan, but I'm studying in LCC International University, and we all are students, but we want to work on mental health and how we can prevent suicides in Lithuania. Um, I'm friends with Becky, and it was uh, very good to know about adverse childhood trauma and experiences. Uh, we came to know that it is one of the leading cause in su uh, for suicides here in this country. Right now, what uh, my question is, how you guys, because you all are experts and already working in this in this field, and we are just starting, we are receiving very good response. But still, the main struggle that I think we are facing right now is to connect with the other organizations that are not related to mental health. Mm -hmm. For example, we want to connect with other community services like police department and the transportation department, how they can partner with us and uh, how we can work together as one society uh, together. I also like um, what, I'm sorry, I don't know the name, but a lady from New Zealand. Um, when we started to work on that, I started volunteering in different places. So, I may actually understand what is happening in the society and I can take the first hand knowledge from people, what they actually experience and what is happening in their families. And it went very well. We interviewed um, different people. We got connected with different youth members. And yes, it is very important to integrate in the society step in where you actually want to make an influence. Uh, thank you very much. Warren, go ahead. You want to talk? Well, thanks, Robin. No, I just wanted to say, I think, what you're talking about is so important. I think a few years ago, when I was trained in mental health as a psychologist, um, it still wasn't common to assess as part of your assessment to ask people about suicide straight away. It was only if there was some indication that there was a problem. Whereas today, it's seen as a, a starting conversation. We ask everybody about whether they're feeling suicidal. Just every time I used to see, ask people that question every time I saw them irrespective of whether they appeared depressed or whether they were coming to me with depression. It should be a normal conversation. So I think a few years ago, we thought if you ask people about suicide, it might make them feel worse or give them ideas. A lot of it is our professional anxiety. So I think just like with adversity, just like with mental health more broadly, just like with gender issues, some of this is about making it permissible, uh, is talking about it in public, is using our own examples you know, I talk more often about my own mental health struggles over the years in public. Um, that's all part of the journey. It's like people were saying earlier on, it's all part of making it acceptable, making it okay. And the more we can be upfront and honest about some of these issues, the less likely is that people are going to feel shame or, you know, embarrassment and, and maybe worry about talking to somebody or asking for help. So, yeah, thanks, Robin, for what you're doing there. It's really important work. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to quickly tell everybody on here, uh, this is Michael from the Relationship Foundation in New York, and everybody can go to our website and download our book at no charge. We have a chapter on nonviolent communication, which we have found incredibly useful in the classroom. We're mostly working in schools. So it's trf.net, the Relationship Foundation. We also do, do, do webinars every month that are free. But uh, I really urge everybody to buy Marshall Rosenberg's book, Nonviolent Communication. But if you want to get a sense of it, and this is something you can introduce to parents about how language affects their children, how, how it affects your marriages, how it affects the, 
the corner person on the corner store. It's it, it I, we believe it can be it can in, facilitate literally a, a global healing. And my other question is, uh, is there a way we can clone you, Becky? Uh, we have to uh, place you <laughs> around the globe as soon as possible. Well, I think that's that. what we're doing. I know some on this call and they were cut out of the same mold. I mean, Stephanie just went to bed and it's 3 a.m. for her and Mike probably about the same. So, um, you know, uh, that's very kind of you, Michael, but I really think that's the group that showed up today. So um, we really do appreciate the work you do. If anyone is interested in the toolkit that we wrote, it, it just addresses some of that, Robin, how to approach police, how to approach doctors. Uh, because we found it was hard in some of those sectors over here too. And we can send you a link to that um, free of charge. So um, with that, um, goodbye from Tennessee. Um, Y'all come back. That's what we say over here. And um, uh, so great to see your faces and uh, appreciate Warren so much and being Warren. able to do this. And uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Clements. So uh, watch for the survey and we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. And we're going we're to ask you to suggest um, things that you want to see in the next sessions. If you want to present something about your work, put that into the survey. And um, yeah, we'll do more of the same. So see you soon. Andy, do you want to say anything at the end? Bye and thanks for coming. I'm sitting here gathering data. This is wonderful. <laughs> Brilliant to see everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.